Olga, why don't we start with you? What is a, uh, what's, what's a sustainable finance champion at ING? First of all, thank you for having me here. Thank you for inviting ING to take part in this wonderful forum. I think it was very useful to exchange some views and to get some new information. It really makes, uh, changes the mindset. Um, sustainability finance champion. We have a sustainability finance network around globally uh, within ING because ING is, uh, has sustainability in the strategy and um, uh, we were the best sustainable bank uh, in the world in 2016 according to Sustainalytics and other uh, ESG rating agencies and uh, we, are, we want to innovate and lead by example. And we have a network in every country. We have sustainability finance champion who is responsible for bringing the knowledge and expertise to the market to push sustainability, to educate also clients. That's what we are doing when we are going to the clients and, and we are talking to sustain, uh, about sustainability with finance people. And usually finance people are not uh, um, aware that much about what is going on in their companies in sustainability area unless it's uh, uh, the company in sustainability business by itself. And also the champion is responsible for organizing some events and uh, uh, developing networking. Great. And so from an ING perspective and looking at sustainability, how broad is that definition? What, what falls within the remit of sustainable finance? I think that sustainability itself is quite a broad definition and uh, therefore if a person is passionate then you will not limit yourself, you will do whatever is possible to engage people both internally and externally. Great. So one of the things that you've been involved in recently will be sustainab uh, sustainability linked loans. It would be useful to understand a little bit around that technology. We spent quite a bit of time actually speaking about bonds or maybe a little bit around loans. It'd be interesting to hear about your experiences in that and what the benefits may be in the context of, of borrowers. Yeah. Um, the difference between green loans, uh, green bonds and sustainability improvement structures is that first of all sustainability improvement products they are used for general corporate purposes. And if green uh, products would be used specifically for green projects, then um, currently, when uh, you, you look at different companies, companies are doing much more in, in the sustainability. They are decreasing their uh, carbon footprint. And what ING wants and tries with this sustainability improvement structure is to, um, to support and to acknowledge that the clients are doing uh, something good and they are trying to be more sustainable. And in case the client becomes more sustainable than ING and other banks, currently are willing even to uh, give some benefit in terms of margin decrease. So basically sustainability improvement structure looks like a margin is linked to sustainability, to, um, sustainability rating of the company or to KPIs. It was introduced by ING in 2017. Currently the market is developing very, uh, very fast. Um, more than 100 banks globally are doing these structures. In Austria last year, Verbund was the first company which uh, had this loan and today another transaction was closed with First Alpine. With Verbund it was uh, 500 million, with First Alpine it's 1 billion. So, and uh, we are working on one more transaction and we are very actively going to the client and discuss, uh, telling that, uh, yeah, we want you to be more sustainable. We believe in clients who are more sustainable, and then we are willing to support you. So, but there, there's a tension there, right? So I, I, I'm not an ING shareholder. Our, our rules internally would prevent that for conflicts reasons. Um, but were I, I, you know, I might question whether it's a good thing for me as a shareholder to see you giving margin away for something as ephemeral as. Uh, uh, meeting ESG KPIs in your, in your borrowing base? Uh, yes, we don't sell this product as a, you know, this is the product with discount. No, because first of all, the benefit is quite small. 
Secondly, it works in both ways. It can be decrease of the margin, it can be increase of the margin if the company does something which would deteriorate the rating of the company, the sustainability rating of the company. And um, another thing is that with this product, we really want to move towards a more sustainable world. It's our mission as we see it. We do it also with other initiatives in, uh, within ING, and therefore this product, it falls under the strategy of ING to bring the world towards more sustainability. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. At this point, I'd like to ask Willem to introduce himself and say a couple of words about how Stocks looks at, uh, uh, at the ESG world. So my name is Willem Q. I head up uh, Stocks' division of, of ESG factor and, and thematic solutions. Um, Stocks as a benchmark provider plays obviously an important role in terms of, of channeling finance. And from an ESG perspective, we at Stocks have a philosophy that, that ESG is now mainstream. And we are including ESG into our benchmark solutions. Uh, we believe that over time, the current free flood market cap benchmark marks will disappear and they will have some form of ESG incorporated in all, of, um, in all of the benchmark solutions. This is quite a bold statement, but if you look at what our clients are telling us, is that they believe by 2030, more than 70% of the clients will only sell ESG solutions. And if we look at the trend that we are seeing in terms of how rapidly uh, ESG solutions are growing, what we are seeing from ETF issuers, this is not in the US only or in Europe. It's actually rolling out globally. Um, you having, we're having constantly questions from markets that you don't associate with ESG who want to learn from that and say, for example, um, we had a delegation from China asking us from a regulatory perspective, they are seeing the U EU regulator introducing ESG they wanted to understand how can they incorporate ESG into their regulatory requirements. And this is quite a, an advanced step because ESG and China is not something that theoretically goes together at the moment. Uh, and I think when you see these kind of bold movements from countries where ESG is not mainstream, uh, that shows you that this trend is, is here to stay. So that, that answers the question around whether this is niche. I think. We've all agreed one way or another that, uh, uh, that sustainable finance has become uh, mainstream. Um, but I guess the question to my mind is how much money is riding on ESG linked indices at this stage? Can you give us a sense of materiality? So I think at the moment we're talking about upwards of $12 trillion. Um, over the past couple of years, we've seen that essentially one in every four dollars that is invested in the U.S. is going to an ESG type of solution. So that shows you the magnitude of it. Uh, if, if a quarter of all investments are going into, into ESG, um, and the U.S. currently, from a, obviously from a political voice line, may not be seen as a, as a real ESG investment part, but I think all the... the um, the funds that are flowing in are flowing into climate funds, for example. So the biggest ETFs in the U.S. that are gathering uh, new assets is, is around climate. So it is quite substantial. The, the definition, within, within the context of your indices, how, how easy is it for you to get comfortable for you know, which, which investments go into which, which category? How do we avoid greenwashing within the index industry? Yeah, I think from the philosophy that we have is, is we've broken um, ESG into three phases. Uh, phase one, we're talking about more your traditional type of investment, about exclusions. Uh, we're talking about your global compact compliance, controversial weapons investment. Um, this would be, if you imagine a pyramid, this would be the base of the pyramid. This is what we implement in our benchmarks currently. So it gets the financial um, world ready for this ESG transition. So we're bringing it into the benchmarks one step at a time. The second part where we start looking at, at positive product involvement, we're starting at looking at ESG integration. 
So taking out companies that do not do well from an ESG perspective and replacing them with companies that do better. This is, I would say, the middle layer of the pyramid. So you're already starting to get slightly more niche, but in essence, this is, I think, where the benchmarks will end up in the next five or 10 years. And then if you look at the top of the pyramid, and this is more where we're talking about impact investing. So your social responsible investment with very, very targeted and perhaps more niche type of investments. This is something that we are rolling out at the moment as well, because if you look at the Nordics, for example, they've been doing impact investing for decades now. But from a benchmarking perspective, this is something that's sorely lacking. And we are now, in essence, creating this entire pillar that we can help all of our clients, all of the regions around the world, so that they can adopt ESG in whichever um, level they have been adopting it in their region at this point in time. So let's go back to the regional point, uh, and maybe to say a touch away from politics and the, the third rail. Um, I happen to be dual UK US citizen, so apologies um, to everybody um, for everything over the last uh, couple of years of politics. But in that, in that space, um, there, are, there are different views around what's, what's ESG, and how does that impact uh, the, the, uh, the index market in terms of what falls into which category? You know, do, does does a US, an unnamed US-based uh, index provider have a different view on these, on these topics? Unfortunately, ESG is not standardized, and I think this discussion is something that comes up uh, quite regularly. So even in Europe, which is clearly seen as a leader in terms of ESG, between two major European countries, i.e. France and Germany, we have a, a very different view on nuclear power, for example. So in Germany, this is not seen as okay to invest in nuclear power, and France obviously sees this is, you know, this is the holy grail for, for renewable energy. So even within uh, a, a, a region that is adopted and embraced ESG, we find differences. When we go to the other side of the Atlantic, obviously, then things start becoming really interesting. And it becomes interesting from a philosophical point of view. So if we look at controversial weapons, within Europe, we, we exclude basically all kinds of uh, controversial weapons. While in the US, uh, certain parts that we perceive as controversial weapons is not seen as something bad. So an example would be uh, anti-personnel mines. Uh, the US view is that this is very important to protect US troops. Uh, for a European investor, it's completely impossible to invest in, uh, in, in anti-personnel mines. So obviously, this makes it hard for us. Um, we would have liked to build one benchmark that covers all. But essentially, at this point in time, at this point in this evolutionary cycle of, of bringing ESG into the benchmark world, we have to now cater to the different demands for our clients. Because if we build something that is either too strict or too narrow or too lax in terms of, of what, we, uh, what we exclude, these products essentially now becomes more or less uninvestable. So if I don't, if I don't exclude anti-personnel mines, uh, immediately that product has no traction within Europe. So it is still unfortunately that we have to tailor make it. Um, and we will see, I think the market in the end will decide where they want to settle on, on how far they want to move the bar. But I think what we've seen over the last three, four, five years is, is that the, the bar is being raised at a dramatic uh, pace. Uh, in the beginning, it was just let's do something to, to say it looks more or less like ESG compliant. And now we are working at extremely tailored um, solutions for some of our clients where we look, for example, at waste management. We look, for example, at, at megatrends. What are the cities of the future going to look like? Um, if I had to talk to a client about uh, what would an index look like that would represent the cities of the future five years ago, they would probably have thought that I was crazy. And now these things are, are becoming the norm for us to build really, really complex solutions for our clients. So one of the phrases that was used earlier today was short-termism. Um, some might argue that the, the, uh, the flip side of that coin um, is liquidity. Um, 
is does the index market, and particularly in this space, and the way it feeds ETFs, does that, does that drive more short-termism, or does it, uh, does it counter short-termism? Does it, does it create a better world at the end of the day? I think if we look at what the aim of our clients are, um, if you look at something that is that I would have termed short-term previously would something be like a structured product. Um, these structured products now have, have running lives of, of eight to ten years and we see quite a lot of renewal on it. So I would say we're definitely heading towards a, a more longer term view. And I think um, if you look at in terms of liquidity, this year we've created the first um, derivative that's based on an ESG benchmark. Uh, the uptake in the market has been phenomenal for it. Uh, it's been around for six months and already we're seeing close to a billion euro trading in it. Um, and essentially what this is helping with is reducing the cost of investing in ESG. So we believe that because ESG is, is, is now mainstream, we also have to make it liquid and we have to make it investable and we have to make it cheap to invest. And by creating these derivatives, we are now well on the way of doing that. Um, and again, you know, two years ago, this was not even on the roadmap. Uh, and now we're seeing a substantial uptake in that. And I think this is something that will probably roll out across the globe. Um, you know, ETFs are becoming cheaper. Uh, and if we can provide solutions that can help an ETF provider with cash management or something like that through a derivative that is actually ESG compliant, um, I think this is definitely the way forward. So I think. By reducing this cost, it will make it even more attractive. There will be less drag in terms of performance being paid away in terms of cost. Um, and I think the, the, long, the longer term view is already being expressed by the, by the next generation of investors. So everybody's talking about this enormous uh, transfer of wealth that is going to happen. What is interesting for us is if you look at the younger generation, um, their view is clearly more sustainable than I would say the current uh, set of investors are. So I think this money will be put to use in a sustainable way, um, in, in a very exciting way for the future. Thank you. So Adam and Olga, you both shook your head a little bit earlier when derivatives and the context of derivatives came up. Any views on how the derivatives market can help this process? Yes, I can start. ING had made a sustainability improvement derivative in the summer this year. So we made it the first time in Germany and it worked well and now we are also trying to apply this structure to derivatives. Not only to derivatives but also to capital market instrument we made also sustainability improvement short chain. And we believe that any banking product which has a longer term, like three, five, seven, ten years, you can apply this ESG rating and you can indeed then uh, try to push the client to uh, improve the CSG rating. And what we're seeing in the United States in terms of renewable energy finance is what Olga has been talking about. Um, just with ESG ratings, you can also do it with weather uh, events or all sorts of different events. Whatever risk you want to uh, take off and give to the derivative holder, or ab absorb in, within your product, you can do it now in the renewable energy space. There's all sorts of custom tailored items. And as Willem was talking about, just to shift, what I've seen in terms of sustainability in the US is that within the last 18 months, the major fund managers for retail, such as Vanguard or Fidelity or Schwab, have introduced ESG indexes and ETFs, and the money is just flowing into them. It is a tidal wave that's moving along, and as you say, there are now, I just was checking the other day, in the Boston area, there are 12 different firms set up to advise people on how to customize their investments. So some people want to have no anti-personnel mines and lots of women uh, CEOs. And some people want to have no alcohol and only churches. And, 
So there's a hundred different ways to do this, and this leads back to the derivatives, because you can actually mix and match through derivatives or through products that are being offered um, on the market uh, as ETFs, and it is these 12 different firms that are advising people what's good, what's bad. It's a booming market. Great. Great. So in the context of booming markets, can you make money in this market? There was, there was an implication in a couple of the things that were said on earlier panels that there's perhaps trade-offs or an either-or. You're either doing good or doing well. Um, what, what's the view on the, on the stage today? Can you make money and do, uh, do, do good? Absolutely. Look at all the firms and all the people who are involved in it. ING can have environmental champions. Environmental champions do not cost much, but anyway. <laughs> um, yes, uh, we as a commercial organization, we are not NGO, and of course we are checking profitability, and of course we are involved in commercial projects. At the same time, uh, sustainability angle, it helps us to go a little bit maybe below the hurdle of uh, our expectations because we really want to move there. Why we are doing this? Because sustainable business will continue longer and we want to stay longer. So it is the investment which will pay off in a longer time. I think from an index perspective, there's a, a flood of research that is suggesting that, uh, that ESG investment does not have a drag on performance. And I think what we have seen from our indices that we've launched over time is that these indices perform more or less the same as the benchmark or with an outperformance. Um, it is not clearly not our view to build an index that has an outperformance because you, you can do that in a backtest very easily and make it look ph phenomenal. Uh, we, we work more from a systematic perspective, so we set a set of rules that is then systematically computer coded applied to a data set. Um, and that's why we are quite comfortable in terms of saying that it, it looks to us like ESG investment does not have a drag on performance. I think a lot of, or the view essentially is that if you look at companies that are extremely well run, this is a, you can use it um, as a proxy for quality. Because essentially for companies to have very good um, policies, very good strategies around ESG, and I'm talking here about the whole spectrum of ESG. So not only um, in terms of health and safety, but also looking at it from an environmental perspective or a social, particularly a governance perspective. Uh, we see that these companies that are performing well here over time tend to avoid having disasters and then tend to avoid having being on the front page for, for uh, doing something completely wrong. Um, and I think that flows through in terms of, um, of the performance that you see. Let's maybe move back to water. A couple of points around water I'd like to pick up. The first, Rob, is for you. What, what is the biggest challenge and what, what would allow you to, to break through and do even more deals? Is it, uh, is it, is it private, more private finance? Is it more donors? Is it, uh, what, what's, what would make you happiest? Yeah, that's a good question. It's, uh, there's no lack of, of funding. And in fact, the banks we're talking to are trying to offer us, you know, they're saying, can you do 700 million instead of 200 million in this deal? And um, so really it's, uh, what I'm doing is really a little wonky and it's uh, complicated. And so usually when I talk to a government, the first thing out of their mouth is, this sounds too good to be true. What's the catch? And, uh, and so, uh, I think for us, it's just getting more of these deals done and, uh, and being able to demonstrate that, yes, this is, actually does work. It's, you know, we're just, it's financial engineering at the end of the day. Um, and so, um, you know, my belief is, is that uh, as we do more of these, uh, we can accelerate this. And the structure that we're coming up with can be used to finance, uh, you know, for a lot of these countries, they, they're not in positions to uh, borrow more money for their uh, other development needs. So we can do more infrastructure financing with this same structure. So sewage treatment plants, um, renewable energy projects, et cetera. And so, um, you know, once we, you know, demonstrate that the model works, you know, I think that will, will accelerate things for us. Great, great. 
and maybe looking at water from a different perspective. One of the things that, Adam, surprised me from your slides was the decline in water investment. Why, why is that the case? That runs in conflict with everything I see uh, you know, on the covers of time around you know, the coming water wars, that, you know, that sort of mentality. Why are we seeing less investment in water than, uh, than historically? Because water hasn't been priced like energy has. Um, wa water just isn't valuable enough for the actual services it provides. And so the companies that have gone into the water sector have not generated the sorts of returns and therefore people like me have stopped investing in water because it hasn't generated the outsized returns that you were talking about just a moment ago. Um, that can change. Certainly a water crisis and an increase in the pricing you'll get my attention immediately. Right. Let's let the ambulance pass. I apologize for the noise outside, particularly the dog, as if on cue. It had just gotten a little warm inside. I thought it'd be easier with the windows open. I'm having a great time getting to ask these clever people these questions, but I, I, I would hate to keep all the fun to myself. Are there questions in the audience that, uh, that people are dying to ask? Hayden, you got any? Thanks for putting me on the spot, Adam. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you were leaning forward like you were. Uh, I'll try and think of something. Um, but I guess, I guess one, one question that we do come across, uh, my name's Hayden, partner at Baker's as well, in London. The kind of debate between the price or the benefit of green versus the cost of brown. Do you see a tipping point on that dynamic in the time Well, if you look at, I guess, my second or third slide, I believe that the tipping point has passed. I believe that green or uh, renewables in the energy sector are much lower cost now for most of the world, not for all of the world, uh, than fossil fuels. That will come later on in all places. And my job as a venture capitalist is to work on those technologies that are coming along to bring down the costs even more so that it becomes pervasive. And if water was priced right, I would invest there and make that much more efficient. Um, one of the interesting companies we've invested in recently uh, senses methane leaks. And you know it, it helps when there's a regulatory structure to support that. But you don't really need that regulatory structure because finding the methane leaks that are wasted money going up in the air is of great value to the oil and gas companies. And so we found that that was a very easy adoption. Does that answer your question? It, uh, well, and, it, and you use it, actually it's interesting. It's the first time in the afternoon, perhaps, that the word regulation came up, right? You know, it's interesting, we've had a couple of sessions now, having started the day, focused on, you know, very heavily on regulation. We've kind of moved away from that. One of the other issues then, though, is, is, is stability. And from an investor perspective, pricing in stability. So, you know, one of the issue, one of the many issues is the ability, inability to price in changing whims around, for instance, what will get subsidized and what will not. And that has had quite an impact on a number of of retail energy companies in particular. How, how, do you look at, uh, how do you look at subsidies? Do you, do you discount those on the basis that they come and go? Or are they relevant to you? Um, or are they just so indifferent from a US perspective that uh, you don't factor them in? Well, stability is the key word. Um, so long as I have a stable system, I can figure out what the the structure, the financing structure would be. And there are banks like ING and the banks that you're working with on the uh, blue debt finance. They're willing to work with you very much to get a deal done. Um, but if there is volatility of regulation, they run away. Um, I don't really need subsidies anymore in the energy space. I would need subsidies in a 
in a bunch of other spaces, but I'd need stability. I will add something on the regulations. Um, ING is a Dutch bank, and in the Netherlands, the legislation and regulation in, uh, with regards to climate is more developed in, than in other countries. And uh, therefore, we as a bank, we are impacted, and uh, we are looking at our retail mortgage portfolio, and uh, it's uh, regulatory driven that uh, we uh, reach out to our retail customers and tell them that by 2050, if I'm not mistaken, uh, you should bring your houses to uh, at least sea level of energy. And this is also one of the goals of ING to have the mortgage por portfolio which would be at least sea level. Because otherwise, and we educate also our retail clients that, you know, according to reg uh, regulations, then you will be taxed, then you will have uh, more cost. So therefore, uh, and uh, another thing is that for um, such financing, which is for uh, green mortgages, we are using subsidies. And then the green bank is formed, which is cooperating with the state, and it's like intermediary, just direct, directing something from the state to the customers. Right. Terrific. Well, we're down to the last couple of minutes. If there are no other questions from the audience, I would love to have a couple of closing thoughts uh, from each of the panelists, maybe both on the topics that we've talked about in the context of the panel, or any of the things that have popped up during what I've found to be an incredibly interesting day. So Rob, why don't we, why don't we start with you? Sure. Um, I would just say that, uh, that uh, you know, this journey for, uh, for us as a conservation organization has been uh, very interesting, very different. We're trying to take things like working with OPEC and political risk insurance, which is typically used to finance uh, or to uh, uh, political risk insurance would be used on a bricks and mortar type thing. And so we, we've been lucky that we've had um, OPEC being willing to work with us and it, you know, it's tweaking the uh, mechanism and, and being willing to, to tweak it to work with us. And, and similarly with the banks, um, uh, you know, the, 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 all, so many banks now have, or basically every bank has a impact investing division or sustainability division. And so there's incredible interest. And, um, and so, you know, it's a, it's a new area for us as a, a conservation organization, but uh, it's been super exciting uh, for us. And, you know, we feel that there's lots of opportunity and uh, it's, uh, you know, I pinch myself every day and go, I, I get paid to do this and I get to go all over the world and see beautiful places. So, um, you know, it's fun to be on the, the edge of something like this new and, and uh, you know, we really look forward to, um, you know, seeing where we can take it um, as a conservation organization, as an NGO. Right. Well, we're very grateful for what you're doing. Well, yeah, I think I've been working in finance my whole life, and um, this, this new chapter of my life of creating indices or creating solutions for our clients is, uh, is very different to my, uh, my past investment banking experience. Um, and I think in a nice way, if we look at what we've heard from all the panels today, what we've heard about what is topical at the moment, I think it's a really exciting space for all of us uh, to work in at the moment because essentially we are slowly in a very, very small way actually changing how the world is operating. Um, and I think that's quite a cool thing to, uh, to say that you've been doing and, and I think what we are seeing, the, the rapid change or the pace of change is, is, is enormous. Um, and that really, in, in a sense, fills me with, uh, with optimism for the future because we all know if we do nothing, where we will end up, and that's not going to be a great place. Uh, and maybe our kids will have a future one day uh, if we start uh, making these changes now. Probably I will just continue the sort of rhythm that, uh, yes, we are working on the change of the world. And this change cannot happen if everyone would stand alone and everyone would try to do something alone. Therefore, uh, on part of ING, we are very vocal. We, have, we are at all of the climate conferences. We are trying, when we are doing the, starting an initiative, 
we are engaging uh, other participants, uh, participants. Either it is uh, it would be regulators, or it would be other banks, or it would be clients. And we believe that only if everyone else is getting engaged and is getting aware about what needs to be done, it can be done. And I would like to thank you, Baker McKenzie, for this opportunity and for bringing different stakeholders together because these events, they really make impact. Great. Thank you. I, too, am an optimist. I think there's going to be a great world out there. Um, We've heard all the risks. We know that by identifying the risks and attacking them, we can make sure that they don't happen as badly as we expect them to. And I see an amazing investment opportunity in the energy storage area, equivalent to the internet, because actually being able to store energy in things like the size of your cell phone that can power your whole house is a complete game changer. And so I see there's real opportunities in that area. But what wakes me up each day and makes me fun to go to work is actually the sorts of things that Rob is doing. Because when you put aside 30% of your ocean area at the size of, of Germany, he was saying, imagine how difficult it is to monitor or enforce this when you're dealing with the ocean. It's a three-dimensional space going down thousands of meters, um, and there are so many new technologies that are needed there to look at the, what the fishing that's going on, the cable laying, the possible mining, the tourism impacts, all of these things. And so I see a, an amazing area to invest as being all of these sensors, these satellites that are going over, the data monitoring, all these interesting areas. The ocean is the wild west, you might say, of investing these days. And in 20 years from now, people will be sitting up here saying they made huge amounts of money by taking land-based practices and going underwater. Thank you all very much. Very much appreciate it. <laughs>